What we call GVMI, the Group Violence Intervention, these days started 25 years ago in Boston. Um, I and two of my colleagues, Ian Peel and Anthony Braga, set up primarily with the Boston Police Department to try to figure out what was going on around the, the terrible crack epidemic era of violence amongst especially young people in the United States. Um, we were 10 years into that epidemic. The gun homicide rate had grown appallingly. It was almost entirely concentrated among young men in, in poor black neighborhoods. It was just devastating. Nothing had been working. People had been doing all kinds of criminal justice things. They had been doing all kinds of prevention things. None of them were making any difference at all that you could tell. And we were coming out of a problem-oriented policing background, which essentially said, pick a problem, figure out what's going on, and try to figure out something to do about it. And the amazing thing was that within really just a couple of months of spending a lot of time with frontline police officers and youth outreach workers and those sorts of things. They knew what was going on and they, they knew that all of this violence was concentrated amongst a very small number of what they called gangs in Boston, really loose neighborhood drug crews. They, they knew sometimes almost ahead of time who was going to get killed because it was so on the street, it was so obvious. And they had figured out something that would get the attention of these groups from time to time, which was the groups were selling drugs and doing all kinds of other crimes and they were on probation and parole and outstanding warrants and unregistered cars and they were paying the child support and on and on and on and on. They were what the literature calls chronic offenders. And what they had figured out was they could essentially tax the violence by saying to these what they call gangs, if you don't stop, if you don't put your guns down, we will enforce the law on everything else that you're doing. You get away with almost everything all the time, but because of the violence, we are gonna make you a special project. And if you want things to go back to the way it was, put your guns down. And it worked. Um, and these days, we know that if you talk to frontline cops, they do things like this. You know, in my country, the federal government couldn't get Al Capone for all the murders he did, so they took him and put him in prison on tax evasion. Mm -hmm. You just figure out how to impose a cost. And what we added to that in Boston was what we called a, a calling. And if we had 20, 20 active groups in the city at any given time, we could get one of them into a meeting, say to them, the next group in Boston that kills somebody gets this special attention. They would go back to their groups, convey this message, and the whole city calmed him. And what we've seen since is that that kind of homicide and gun violence, what we now call community violence, has this characteristic of, of being really concentrated in very small numbers of very active people. It turns out the same thing is true for public drug markets. The same thing is true for the worst kind of domestic violence. The same thing is true for the people who really cause safety issues inside prisons. Pretty much it seems like that's the way the world works. And so for some of these most extreme problems, this basic approach of identifying those extreme people, putting on, on notice ahead of time that one or two things they're doing will come with a price, and then mobilizing community and social services around that ends up being a pretty effective prescription.
The, the first time we did this in Boston, within literally a couple of months of that first face-to-face -face meeting, that first call in with, with gang group members, you could tell that things in the city had gotten quiet. I remember one of our, our partners um, coming into the, the room where we, we organized and, and drove what we called ceasefire in Boston. Um, and he was incredibly excited because he had just seen two gang members having a fist fight. And he said, I haven't seen a fist fight in 10 years. Mm -hmm. They have put their guns down. It was amazing. Um, and then the statistics bore that out. So the formal evaluation said two thirds reduction in homicide amongst those at age 24 and under over two and a half years a 50% reduction in homicide, all ages, all causes, everything citywide. And that was 25 years ago. The, the now formal systematic reviews, the, the, the aggregate analyses of the analyses, um, the Campbell Collaboration has done this, and the National Academy of Sciences and a bunch of others, but they consistently find um, in the words of, of one of them, this is the most effective intervention available for homicide and gun violence. Kind of taking on board any really distinctive new way of thinking and, and acting on anything meaningful as a process. Most of this work up until pretty recently has been what we would call domestic in the United States. It's, it's been within the United States. And 25 years ago, nobody believed that this was real and nobody believed it could work. And the idea that you're going to deal with the most dangerous men in your city by putting them in a room and sitting down and talking with them politely. If you are in law enforcement, you're going to tell them ahead of time exactly what your plans were. Not too many people thought that was a good idea. Um, in the United States, that was 25 years ago, and this is routine now. People have seen it, they've tasted it, it works, they know it works. Um, it's taught them some things such as the most dangerous men in your city are more rational than you think they are. And their behavior will support that. But over the, the course of those 25 years, I think the main, the main objection was that may have worked over there, but we're different here. That can't work here. And over 25 years, that's turned out not to be true. Here is not that different from there. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the same thing now internationally. The, once again, people are looking at something that happened in a country not their own. And the laws are different, and the society is different, and the culture is different, and the, the issues on the ground are different. And they're again saying that may work there, but it won't work here. And what what we're seeing is if you if you take a moment and ask some very simple questions, and they are fundamentally with this most important issue that you're you're thinking about, this critical public safety issue, is it driven by a small number of really extreme people? Are those people as much victims as they are offenders? Are they doing a lot of what they're doing because they are at enormous risk and in pretty justified fear for their lives? Are they afraid for their friends and loved ones and families? Are they in, in groups? Is what's going on less about them personally than it is about the, the gang or the group or the network that they're in? Um, and are they getting a consistent response from, from the law and the legal authorities? Are people giving them all the help and support that they, they, they deserve and need? And do they understand how much of their own 
communities value them but hate the violence and hate the crime that they're doing. And what you find over and over and over again is wherever here is, that's right, it is different than over there, but it's not different with respect to those things. Those things turn out to be pretty universal. Part of what's, what's happened with what, what a lot of people call focused deterrence is that it has refocused people's thinking on deterrence. That's not what the phrase means, but that's what's happened. And deterrence is, a, is an old and, and very simple idea. And it is, it is just that if people know that something they're thinking about doing is going to come with a cost, they're somewhat at least less likely to do it. And that's a simple, simple, simple idea. Um, and if you walk around in your life, you see how fundamental deterrence is. People don't touch hot stoves. <laughs> um, they don't do crimes when there is a police officer sitting right next to them. Um, they are not insulting to their girlfriend when their mother's standing there. They look both ways before they cross the street. Deterrence is simple and profound and very, very, very human. The criminal justice system in most places doesn't do a very good job of creating clear, predictable, meaningful, and legitimate costs. It tries but especially the most serious and at-risk people. Um, they tend to do a lot of crimes and they tend to get away with almost everything they do. And they know it and the cops know it and the judges know it. Um, so our traditional legal activities do not do a very good job of creating an environment where you know that there will be a cost and so you don't do it. The cost doesn't have to be enormous, it doesn't have to be profound, it doesn't have to be brutal. Uh, it can be very, very, very small. What really matters is what theorists have always talked about, which is certainty and swiftness. And what people are talking about a lot now, which is legitimacy. A, a sanction that is seen by the person in question and his family and his community as, as unjust, as illegitimate, it's not the law, it's not a community statement about right and wrong, it's just the state being brutal. And state brutality doesn't carry a lot of moral value, not with anybody. So this, this has really been about reinventing deterrence, not in the way that we've thought about it, but in the way that it really operates in, in real life with real people in, in, in real settings. And it does turn out, in fact, that when you get that right, people that we have thought are crazy and irrational, sociopaths and worse, turn out to be very responsive. And one of the things that makes you realize is, you know, we, we've been doing the law the way we've been doing the law, and they've been responding to it in the way they've responded to it. Uh, and we have looked at them and said, you're not responding to our law, you must be irrational. And in fact, a lot of the time, it's us who've been irrational. And when we get more rational, they respond. So I, I heard a story lately that, that I love because it, it so proves the point of what we're talking about. And it was um, from a, a, a prison administrator who said, we used to have a lot of problems with the male inmates sexually abusing the female guards. And thankfully, he was not talking about rape and, and that kind of sexual assault, but he was talking about gross, bad behavior on the part of the inmates. They would display themselves. They, they do nasty things. Right. And he said, we, we had 
all these plans, we had graduated sanctions, people could end up in solitary confinement and none of it worked. So we don't have that problem these days. These days when an inmate does something like that, in a week or two I call him to my office and I punch the button on my speaker phone and on the other end of the phone is his mother back in, in the community. And the three of us have a conversation about what he's been doing with respect to the female guards, and it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> That's so that and what what we think our mothers think of us matters a lot. Um, I will ask rooms full of law enforcement folks if they, if when they were growing up, they were afraid of the police, and a few people will raise their hand. If I asked them when they were growing up whether they were afraid of their mother, everybody raises their hand. And your mother thinking badly of you is a cost. It's not a cost imposed by the criminal justice system. And probably because of that, it means more. And so deterrence is really simple. It's about costs you care about and costs that you think are legitimate. It does not have to be extreme, it does not have to be the death penalty, it does not have to be life in prison, it can be very minor in the way that we usually think about things. But if you care about it and you know about it ahead of time, then people are pretty sensible.